morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us on this uh, beautiful Friday. Again, I'm Chris Bozier. I'm a psychiatrist in private practice from the Indianapolis area, and pleased please to be with you here today to share some information, uh, sort of on an overview of complementary and alternative medicine and what the science says behind some of these treatments. And I have to give you a mea culpa to begin with, because as I was going through these slides, I was looking at them, and I realized that this uh, maybe came across as being a little more negative than what I had intended. So. Um, I, I would preface the talk by saying, listen, as a, as a psychiatrist and as a pharmacologist, I will be the very first person to admit that our FDA-approved treatments leave an awful lot to be desired, right? In, in mental health especially, listen, we're lucky if any of our treatments work in more than 30% of patients. That's why it's a good thing that we have so many you know, options to choose from. Some things where we have a higher hit rate, right? Our, our stimulant medicines for ADHD, pretty high hit rate. Benzodiazepines, right? High hit rate for anxiety. But when we come to our workaday medicines, things for depression, mood stabilizing medicines, antipsychotic medicines, honestly, if you, if you look at the literature as a whole, we're pretty happy if we find a medication that comes to market that will work right off the bat in 30 or 40 percent of, of patients. So I, I think that both helps us understand why it is that people frequently look for other types of treatment. And I think it's an important context. Uh, so hopefully my comments about complementary and alternative medicine and some of the science behind them doesn't sound too negative because really it's, it's in good company. Richard Feynman, one of my favorite quotes. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. We're all vulnerable to our own prejudices, beliefs, confirmation biases. It's part of the human condition. It's just how we're wired. It's, it's part of, uh, it's a consequence of having a human brain, right? So we always want to have a certain amount of, of skepticism and, and self-critique, uh, I think, as we're, as we're dealing with patients and as we're responsible for their health care. Another of my favorites, Neil deGrasse Tyson. The good thing about science is, is that it works whether you believe in it or not. It's sort of the very nature of science. That's why science is not a belief system. Science is the best thing we have going for us as humanity, in my opinion. Science is a self-correcting system, right? All scientific truths are not big T truths. They're little T truths. They're truths until something more confirmable or consistent or predictive comes along. So it's always a work in progress. Um, so I think that's the beauty of science and the beauty of trying to take a science-based approach to the practice of medicine. So despite a wide variety of proven treatment interventions uh, that are available, patients will frequently seek out other types of treatment, other types of complementary treatments uh, in addition to or in place of what we're uh, frequently recommending or prescribing for patients. And there's a number of reasons, right? Limitations of currently available treatments. Like I said, none of our medicines work for each and every patient that we see. The effectiveness of these things can be in question. Tolerability can be an issue. Almost all of our medicines have some capacity for side effects, and the degree to which a patient may experience a side effect varies greatly from one patient to the next. The cost of medicines is frequently a barrier. People may want to avoid seeing a healthcare professional. Maybe they lack insurance, maybe they're uncomfortable, maybe there's something culturally going on that, uh, that leads people to feel less comfortable seeking out traditional healthcare. Perception of greater safety of complementary and alternative medicine, um, which, which I always think is, uh, um, uh, is a little ill-considered, right? Uh, we'll talk about some logical fallacies in a second, but that taps into sort of the naturalistic fallacy. Distrust of big pharma or the medical industrial complex. And a lack of success with prior treatments. Maybe people have tried it our way before and it just hasn't worked for them. So a few logical fallacies. The argument from antiquity, it's been done this way for dozens of years or hundreds of years. This treatment goes back thousands of years, right? Well, just, just because it's ancient doesn't mean it's wisdom. The naturalistic fallacy. Keep in mind that the universe at best doesn't give a crap about you, and in most cases, in most parts of the universe, it's actively trying to kill you. Um, so just because it's natural doesn't make it safe, right? Plutonium is natural. Nothing's more natural than being mauled by a bear, right? So natural doesn't always translate into good, effective, or safe. 
post hoc ergo propter hoc, after which, therefore, because of which. Um, again, our brains are built to be assimilation engines. They're association machines. So we see things and we try to connect them. We try to, our brains naturally try to force these connections and these associations. So we were, it's very easy for us to think that because I did this thing, that's why this other thing happened. Uh, one of my least favorites, the argument from popularity or celebrity, right? Jenny McCarthy, um, huge proponent of the, of, for the anti-vax movement, was critical in, in helping to bring Andrew Wakefield after he had been discredited in the UK for his, uh, for his article that he published in The Lancet, uh, where, he, uh, where he suggested that the MMR vaccine was responsible for causing autism or contributing to the risk. Uh, eventually found out that he fabricated much of his data. This article was withdrawn from the Lancet. He lost his medical license in the UK, uh, but Jenny McCarthy and crowd helped to bring him to the United States to continue the anti-vax uh, message. Uh, and of course, because of this, because of decreasing vaccination rates, we're dropping below the level of herd immunity for some of these childhood illnesses that we had almost eradicated. And especially measles has been a problem Measles, we had really under very good control. We're seeing a resurgence now. We're seeing some areas of the country where uh, herd immunity for measles has dropped below the level where we can count on herd immunity. And measles is a particularly bad disease, not only because it's so incredibly easy to transmit and it's so incredibly dangerous and highly lethal, but having the measles can wipe out a lot of your pre-existing immunity. People that get measles may lose anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of their of their immunoglobulin response to other medicines. So having measles may wipe out whatever immunity you've had from prior diseases or prior vaccinations and sort of hit the reset switch for you. The argument from incredulity, it's a big world. This world has more splendid and amazing and awesome things than we can fit into our tiny human brains. So just because we, it's not within our experience or belief system doesn't mean that it's not true. So a lot of people, suffer from this, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it phenomena. So dietary supplements. Um, I'm going to talk for a second about the Dietary, and Sup dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, which sounds pretty good. It's got the word education in it. That must be a positive thing, right? So this was authored by Senator Orrin Hatch. Orrin Hatch, uh, now retired, retired uh, in, uh, 19, was it 19, just a couple, 2019, I think, maybe. Served 42 years in the Senate, longest serving Republican senator. Um, significant political contributions from the really massive supplement industry in Utah. And in fact, family members and a number of former aides work as lobbyists for the industry. And this is really the act that was responsible for removing vitamins and supplements from the purview of the FDA. So, Unlike medications, foodstuffs, which the FDA has um, the ability to regulate, to evaluate, and to comment upon, that was removed from the, from the purview of the FDA by this act. So it allows for the so-called structure function claims to be made without the need for any proof. So it sort of relies on, well, we've got some basic science to suggest that this seems to work this way, therefore, if we do this thing chemically or physiologically, we ought to be able to predict the outcome. And of course, as we know from our experience in the whole of medicine, that's, the world's more complicated than that. It doesn't always work out that way. So it allows them to make virtually any claim for these substances as long as they uh, include that thing that we all hear read very rapidly at the end of any commercial for this stuff. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product's not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any condition or prevent any disease. So as long as they put that tagline on there, they have fairly wide uh, ranging ability to make any kind of claims that they want about various supplements, vitamins, minerals, et cetera. New York Times article back in uh, 2015, the Attorney General's office sent a cease and desist letter to a number of retailers demanding that they stop selling a variety of supplements. And this was in response to an investigation where they looked at 24 supplements that were being sold and they did DNA fingerprinting on them. And what they found of those 24 products is all of them except for five 
either had unrecognized you know, plant or animal material in them, uh, or came, there were things that came from plants that were not what was listed on the label. So that the, the lack of the regulatory oversight, the lack of guidance, the lack of the ability of some sort of body to go in and make sure that manufacturers are not only making things in a way that is safe and consistent, but actually has in it what it says it has. We also see frequent adulterations, uh, and this may be pretty small, I'm not sure how it's coming across on your, on your screen, but very frequently, whatever they say is in um, these supplements is not what's actually in the supplements. Now, sometimes they're just other excipients, sometimes there are other things to fill up space, uh, which may or may not be a problem. I guess there's a concern if you're not listing what the contents are, if people have an allergy to that substance, that certainly can be a problem. But some of the things here are actually medicines. So some of the over-the-counter natural uh, substances that are sold to enhance male sexuality actually just have sildenafil in it, right? Generic Viagra. Or there are medications that are sold to help with sleep, a natural homeopathic uh, organic treatment for sleep disorders that contain benzodiazepines or hypnotic medications. Medicines that are there to help with anxiety or uh, that have beta blockers in them. Um, I had a case a number of years ago where a patient was taking a substance that was, that was sold as a natural mood stabilizer, completely safe, organic, all natural. And I sent it in to have it tested, so it wasn't a tiny amount of lithium. It was about the same level that I would treat somebody at when I was prescribing lithium. So, so those are some of the concerns. Um, and again, as much as many of us are not big fans of big government and, and don't like a lot of regulation in our lives, this is an area where maybe having some regulation is appropriate. I said up front that I was gonna offer a mea culpa and try not to be uh, too mean, or I didn't wanna come across as being demeaning or bashing complementary alternative medicine. I'm gonna step out of that bubble for now is I'm gonna bash the hell out of homeopathy and tell you quite frankly, if you're using homeopathy as part of your practice, stop immediately if you have any sense or any concern about the practice of science-based medicine. So homeopathy originated with Samuel Hahnemann. He was a German physician in the late 1700s. Now again, in context, he was trying to do the right thing, right? So he was concerned about the state of medical treatment. He was existing in a time of bloodletting and correcting ill humors and bleeding and putting leeches on people and trepanation and all these types of things. So he wanted a way to come up with some sort of theory that would help guide medical treatment. Completely reasonable and admirable desire, right? So he felt that maybe the disease was caused by the disturbances in the body's ability to heal itself, the body's innate intelligence, uh, and that it sometimes needed some sort of prompt to initiate this healing process. So he developed this theory of similars, meaning that if I find a substance that creates a symptom, perhaps I could give somebody a very, very, very small amount of that substance, and that would trigger the body's own innate intelligence to be able to treat this condition. A little pre-scientific, but Again, his heart was in the right place. He, he was just born a little too early. He didn't have the science to, to help him understand this in a better way. So homeopathic products are made from plants, minerals, other substances, and these preparations are made by making incredible dilutions of the original substance uh, to really unbelievable levels. So typically what they'll do is they'll take one part of substance. Let's say you're making a treatment for anxiety or insomnia. And you say, well, law of similars, what, what can cause anxiety or insomnia? Caffeine. So I take caffeine and I take one part of caffeine and I dissolve it into either nine parts of water or alcohol if I'm making a 10X dilute or a 1X dilution, or one part caffeine to 99 parts water or alcohol if I'm making a 1C dilution. And the serial dilutions are made by repeating the same scheme. So once I've taken my one part caffeine to 99 parts water, I mix that up, I take one cc out of that, and I mix it into another 99 parts of water, and now I have a 2C uh, dilution. 
So various ways to look at this, again, whether they're using the 1x or the 1c kind of dilution and how far it goes out. But the power of serial dilutions really dilutes this to an extraordinary extent, right? So most products that are sold are somewhere between a 6x and a 30x dilution. Some of them are a 30c dilution. So a 30x dilution means that the original substance has been diluted that many times. I'm not sure what that number is. That's too many zeros for me to count. So statistically, in order to have one molecule of the original substance present in the 30x pre the preparation, you would need to consume a volume of liquid or of water or alcohol that it was dissolved in. You would need a container that was 50 times the size of the Earth. And for a 30 seed preparation, you would need a container 30 billion, or, yeah, 30 billion times the size of the Earth. On average, stoichiometrically, to have one molecule of that original substance be present. And if anybody's been to the pharmacy, this is a thing that I still see sold in pharmacies fairly frequently. Filiacoxinum, right? This was originally proposed by French physician Joseph Roy based on his misidentification of an oscillating bacterium that he found. And this was, you know, everything old is new again. This was identified in Spanish flu victims back in 1917, 1918. So he claimed to have seen the same bacteria in cancer sufferers. Interesting. So he proposed a homeopathic preparation, which he had isolated from a duck's liver, um, found this bacteria in this duck liver. So this Ocilococcus bacterium uh, became known um, as a potential homeopathic remedy for a variety of things. Now, the problem is there's no such thing as Ocilococcinum. They were air bubbles moving under Brownian motion underneath a microscope slide, right? So we've known this now for decades and decades and decades and decades, but still, it's sold. Now, this is a 200C dilution, which probably means that was the most valuable duck in history, right? So there's its concentration. I don't care what was in that duck's liver, I think if you dilute it that much, it's probably not doing much for patients. But that doesn't stop it from being sold. Sold for at least 65 years uh, by 50 different companies. And the US sales last year were still, still $15 million a year for selling a dilution of air bubbles. So homeopathic practitioners believe that these impossibly dilute preparations are made because they'll, they'll listen to the chemistry. They say, okay, well, we get it that there's not a molecule present, but the presence of this molecule imprints a memory onto the water or alcohol that has a healing property. I must have missed that day in chemistry or, or biochem. So critics, of course, have pointed out, well, if that's the case, listen, every drop of water on the planet ought to contain a cure all maladies, right? Think about how water is recycled, whether it's rainwater or water coming out of the fountain, whatever it is. Everything ought to cure everything then, right? So they say, well, no, it's not the case because you can't just introduce this to the solvent. You have to go through a process called succussion, which is where you do the dilution and then you can't just mix it up, but you have to strike it on an elastic surface preferably a leather-bound version of the homeopathic pharmacopoeia. And so that's how these things are prepared. And that's how you magically imprint their properties onto water. And I apologize, I, I had, had to change up the slide deck to an older version of the slide deck um, uh, because of some technical difficulties. So I think, I think this may play, but we'll, we'll take a look here. Sound or we can boost the sound. Are you able to hear that on the? Oh, can I get in the audio? Yeah. 
Is it playing locally on the computer? Uh, that's okay. I can. We'll, we'll, we'll skip that. So the, the Federal Trade Commission of, of, of more recent times um, has been paying a little bit more attention to this. So in 2016, they announced a, a multi-year study um, that should, be com should have been completed actually a year or so ago now that was going to require homeopathic products to include these statements that there's no scientific evidence um, backing these claims and that they're based on theories from the 1700s that are not accepted by modern medical experts. Um, and you can see that report, it's available online. Unfortunately, the, FTA, the FTC doesn't have jurisdiction over the FDA. So it's still up in the air what the FDA is going to do, if anything. Um, one of the things that's in, my, in the newer slide deck that's not here was just a word about traditional Chinese medicine, because that's become quite popular again over the past five years or so. Um, and there's an assumption, again, I think this, this uh, argument from antiquity, this idea that traditional Chinese medicine is something that's been around for thousands of years. And actually, really, when traditional Chinese medicine started was in the 1940s under Chairman Mao. So Mao was dealing with a very large country, large population, and he recognized that they clearly didn't have enough physicians to treat everybody in their nation. So he employed, um, he, he created um, sort of this army of what he referred to as barefoot doctors. And these were people who would be brought in from villages and schooled in traditional Chinese medicine and sent back to their communities to treat people in these more remote areas. Now, Chairman Mao himself said, I think that we need to promote Chinese medicine. I don't believe in it and I would not use it myself but I think this is good for our, this is good for our nation. Um, so traditional Chinese medicine is not something that's been done for thousands of years. It's something that's been done since the 1940s and largely because of a lack of access to Western medicine. Members of the, of the committee, members of the party were always treated in Westernized hospitals with Western medicines. It was people in more remote areas and peasants that were treated with traditional Chinese medicine until those of us in the West hear about it and think, this sounds really cool. This has been around for a long time. This must have something to offer. So we saw, we saw people really adopting um, this interest in traditional Chinese medicine. And why are we so interested in traditional Chinese medicine? Why, why aren't people interested in traditional European medicine? Where, where's people clamoring for bloodletting or trephination or using vibrators to treat hysteria or doing surgery without washing your hands. Those are all traditional European medical techniques. Why, why are we not so excited about those? Chiropractic. So chiropractic care was started by David Palmer in Toronto and born in 18, uh, 1845. So he worked, he had several different jobs as many people did in the day, right? He was a shop owner. He was also a magnetic healer. Magnets were very big back at the at the early part of the, the turn of the century. Um, so people were very interested in magnets and assumed that they might have all kinds of magical healing properties. So he worked as a magnetic healer for almost a decade. And in his shop, he met a janitor named Harvey Lillard. And this, this uh, employee had reportedly become rapidly deaf after he bent over in a cramped way and exerted himself picking something else, picking something up and couldn't hear suddenly. Um, and he said that he felt something give way in his neck or back right before this happened. So David Palmer examined him and said, you know, I think one of your vertebrae is out of alignment. I'm going to push it back into position. And then reportedly that instantly cured his deafness. Not aware of any branch of the, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, not a neurosurgeon, but I, I don't recall any branch of the auditory nerve that goes down through the neck into your back and comes back up to your ear. I think there's a recurrent laryngeal nerve that does something like that, but I don't think there's a recurrent auditory nerve that does anything like that. So Palmer went on to develop a theory that almost all human disease must be caused by misaligned spine bones, right? Called subluxation. And that this blocked the expression of innate intelligence or the soul, spirit, or spark of life that controlled all healing processes. And came up with this theory that we could treat nearly all medical conditions by correcting subluxations and restoring the flow of this vital energy. Now, I do refer to chiropractors, and chiropractors that are doing treatments like gentle manipulation, 
heat, traction, ultrasound, exercise, every bit as reasonable as any of those therapeutic modalities when, when we prescribe them as physicians or nurse practitioners or physician assistants or physical therapists. But the idea that subluxations are responsible for causing things like autism, cancer, diabetes, um, uh, allergies, again, is purely pre-scientific magical thinking based on vitalism, this idea that there are waves of energy going through the body and somehow if you unblock them or redirect them or correct them, that you'll be able to, to help patients. Craniosacral therapy is another thing we're seeing sort of a resurgence of. This was developed back in, in the 70s. And really it's based on the belief that by gently manipulating a patient's head, you can move their skull bones around and correct the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be greatly concerned if somebody was pushing on my head to the extent that they could move my skull bones, right? Um, so this is recommended for a, a wide variety of things, general health benefits. And again, people, people like this therapy because it feels good to be touched, right? So I'm not saying that this doesn't offer anything to patients. I'm saying that this is probably one of the many things that offers a nonspecific therapeutic benefit. So there's nothing, I, I have a hard time accepting that physiologically practitioners are really accomplishing something, moving skull bones and redirecting the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, but it feels good to have somebody focus on you. Go and lay on a comfortable table in a pleasant surroundings um, and have somebody talk to you while they're touching you. Same thing with massage, right? Same thing of getting a back scratch. So I don't doubt the benefit of these things. I just doubt whether or not there's some specific therapeutic benefit. I think it's a non-specific therapeutic benefit. And if you want to do it, great, more power to you. You should do it. But just recognize it for what it is. Energy therapies. Um, so these include a number of uh, types of therapies, again, where the practitioner has some uncanny ability to redirect or manipulate the vital energy of the body. So these are things like Reiki, Qigong, or therapeutic touch. So developed by uh, a Japanese Buddhist in the early 1920s, part of it was a spiritual practice to treat emotional, physical, and mental illness. Frequently, um, you know, claimed that they can redirect or affect life energy, life force, vital force, by using their hands placed on or above a person's body. And we see this being even done at, you know, well-known, well-respected clinics, despite the absolute lack of any type of plausibility or scientific proof behind it. So there's the Cleveland Clinic for, for Reiki, listing the different things that, you know, uh, it's used for. They're careful not to claim it treats, you know, cures or prevents, but these are the things that they use it for, right? This therapeutic, not even laying on of hands, but just coming close to touching somebody. Okay. Sounds good. Looks good. I wish it were true. Qigong, life energy cultivation, again, often used for recreation, sometimes medical treatments, sometimes part of martial arts lore. Um, incorporated into Tai Chi. Great exercise, but again, non-specific therapeutic benefit. Now, therapeutic touch. This is more in the purview of medical care, right? This was started largely by, um, in the 70s, by Dora Coons, who was a, uh, who was a promoter of theosophy, basically a, a, uh, a theory that you could have attained sort of spiritual enlightenment by having some sudden, profound religious experience that would put you in touch with a higher power. And then Dolores Krieger, who was an emeritus uh, professor of nursing science at New York University. And this is fairly frequently practiced by nurses, often in cancer treatment centers as part of palliative treatment, where they'll come in and they'll run their, they'll either touch patients or not even touch patients, run their hands above patients to redirect their life energy to treat any variety of symptoms. So one, one of my other science superheroes is Emily Rosa. Emily Rosa was the youngest person to have a research study published in JAMA back in 1998. 
She conducted a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of therapeutic touch when she was nine years old for her fourth grade science fair project. And she came up with a pretty good experimental design. She said, okay, if therapeutic touch is a real thing, and if these people can manipulate energy fields, then it shouldn't be too much of an ask for them to be able to tell when is their hand over my hand. I'm not even asking them to demonstrate their affecting an energy field. I just want to say, can they detect it? Can they feel an energy field from my hand? So this was her scientific setup. She basically had a cardboard screen with holes in the bottom where the therapeutic touch providers could put their hands underneath and she would hold her hand over either their left or right hand and simply asked them, which hand am I holding my hand over and recorded their results and did the statistics. So she tested 21 therapeutic touch practitioners, and out of, 100 and, uh, out of 280 trials, they correctly identified the hand, which she held her hand over, 123 times. So 44% accuracy rate, actually a little less good than a coin flip. Right? So she became the youngest author to ever be published in JAMA. So with, with all these energy therapies, um, I'm, I'm dubious, right? Um, Dr. Cooper, we were speaking last night, her husband's a nuclear physicist, which I think is way cool. Would have loved to have gone into physics, I just don't have the math for it. But if I were to ask your husband for the definition of energy, he would not explain that it was some sparkly shimmering cloud or some laser-like projection that comes from certain part of our bodies. As a physicist, he's likely to tell me, energy is the ability to do work. So anytime somebody tells you that something is affecting energy, substitute the phrase, the ability to do work and see if it still makes sense. So we're pretty good at detecting energy, as it turns out. I'm a big astronomy buff too. Voyager 1 launched September 5th, 1977. It's, been, it's now left our heliosphere, it's outside of our solar system now. Currently about 14 billion miles from Earth, traveling at about 38,000 miles per hour. 20 and a half light hours away, right? It has a 22.4 watt transmitter. That's less power than the light in your refrigerator. And we can still detect that signal. We still get telemetry from that probe. And by the time that 22.4 watt signal travels 14 billion miles, it's 0.1 billion billionth of a watt. And we can detect this. We've never detected any kind of vital life force. You can detect heat from the body, you can detect electric currents, but in terms of the vital force, the energy, the life energy, we've not been able to find it. Acupuncture. Acupuncture has become fairly mainstream. Um, and, I've, and we all have a lot of patients who, who really report a lot of benefit with this. Um, but again, I think it's important to say, What's the science say to know when I should recommend this? Or if patients have questions, how do we best respond to their questions about it? So acupuncture is often claimed to be um, uh, a 4,000-year-old treatment, right? It originated in China 4,000 years ago. Well, not clear that it originated in China. It may have actually originated in Turkey. Um, and it's tough for them to document that this was going on 4,000 years ago because Chinese language didn't exist 4,000 years ago. And also, when they describe needling in older text, it's not acupuncture. Because you've seen acupuncture needles, right? You think they were able to make those kind of needles 4,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago? Make hair thin metal needles? No. The needles that they originally used in needling were more like crochet hooks, like knitting needles. And they would poke those at you or stab those at you. So what they originally reported was acupuncture is really not what we conceive of as being acupuncture now. So here's a couple of the, probably the biggest study ever done on acupuncture, the biggest and best study ever done for back pain and acupuncture. Um, 683 adults randomized to either individualized acupuncture, so going to see somebody who has been doing acupuncture for seven to 18 years, who, where they said, treat people like you normally treat them. A second group standardized acupuncture. These were prescribed um, to be done by people that were trained in acupuncture but didn't have that much experience, and they were basically working out of a textbook 
to say where the meridians were. This is where you put the needles. Then a third group of simulated acupuncture, where you took like an acupuncture draw, and instead of putting a needle in there, you just put a toothpick in and twirled it, which recreates the same sensation. People can't tell when you're doing an actual needle or if you're pushing a toothpick against their skin and twirling it. So that was the, the sham condition or usual care, just what, whatever they were doing before. Twice weekly treatments for three weeks, then weekly for four weeks. Outcomes they looked at were the, um, uh, the role in disability questionnaire, how bothersome their pain was. Secondary outcomes, looking at the SF36, number of days spent in bed, lost days from work or school, use of health services for back pain. And here's what the data showed. So in the red, usual care, the yellow, individualized acupuncture, the green, standard acu standardized acupuncture, and the blue, simulated acupuncture. So what did all the popular press report when this study came out? Acupuncture beat placebo very clearly, better than placebo. But so was rubbing a toothpick on the back and by just as much effect. Same kind of results if we were looking at the symptom bothersness scale. So all groups showed improvement and decreased symptoms compared to standard care, but there was no statistical difference between skilled acupuncture, standardized acupuncture, and faux acupuncture. Acupuncture for asthma, again, and this shows the split sometimes between subjective and objective data. So this was a study where they looked at either using albuterol, a placebo for albuterol, sham acupuncture, the toothpick uh, you know, thing, uh, which they didn't know was a toothpick, or no intervention. 46 patients, double blind crossover study with four arms. And here are the results for subjective improvement. Compared to no intervention, albuterol or the sham acupuncture gave a significantly different effect, right? Equal to the effect of placebo. Subjectively, what happens when you look at FEV1s? Yay, science. Yay, drugs. Albuterol was the only thing that really gave people true improvement. But subjectively, that, that's the draw for so many of these treatments. Chronic Lyme disease. Depending on the area of the country that you live in, chronic Lyme disease is, is a real thing. This is a known disease state. This can cause a lot of uh, problems. This can cause known neurologic symptoms. The, the problem is um, all across the country and so, several areas where, in, where Lyme is not endemic, you're seeing clinics popping up specializing in treating Lyme disease. And with these clinics, almost everybody that goes to that clinic winds up being diagnosed with Lyme disease. So the CDC has a recommendation for how you test for this. Very reasonable test. Two steps uh, study using a conventional ELISA method uh, and then antibodies that are not specific to, to Borrelia burgdorferi itself, then followed by a Western blot confirmation specific for Borrelia burgdorferi. So this test is almost 100% accurate. And the good news is, is if we diagnosed you with chronic Lyme disease, we're really good at treating it, right? Doxycycline does a pretty awesome job of treating Lyme disease when you catch it early enough. But there are people that have chronic you know, conditions that they feel are from either ongoing or residual effects from Lyme disease. So there are other studies, and sometimes these clinics use these other type of studies, like the urine polymerase chain reaction study, that's felt to have too many false positives to be reliable. But that's what a lot of these outside clinics use. And there have been multiple studies showing there's no benefit from doing chronic antibiotic therapy for, for these patients. Under blinded conditions, there's no benefit seen in doing this. Um, and I, I will say just quickly, this, this hit home for me um, a few years ago. A patient I'd seen since early in my practice, this was a young man, I started seeing him in his 30s. He had, he had really bad schizoaffective disorder. Um, pretty well controlled on medicines, really nice family. Father was a physician, um, mother was involved in an advocacy organization. Um, and he was doing okay, he was doing pretty well, living at home, 
worked part time in his dad's office, um, had some anxiety issues that we were dealing with too. But I was seeing him maybe every three to six months for just outpatient medication management. And he, he came in one day with his mom with some literature, and she asked me if I was a Lyme literate physician. That's what a lot of these clinics refer to themselves as. Are you a Lyme literate physician? To which I said, well, I am actually, but probably not in the same way that you mean it. And so she proceeded to tell me that they had been referred by their, by their new physician who did a lot of complementary and alternative medicine treatment to a specialty Lyme clinic in town and that he had been diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease. In fact, not just him, the whole family. He and his brother and both his parents had been diagnosed with chronic Lyme. And I said, you know, I said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in this. I'd love to know how this was diagnosed. What are the symptoms? What kind of testing was done? So I get the records from the clinic. And of course, they use the other, the polymerase chain urine test. And I said, you know, I said, there's some controversy over this. There's some concerns about the accuracy of this test. I'd like you to go and get, uh, go and see an infectious disease specialist and get the testing that the CDC recommends, um, which I think they did, which was negative. Um, but they still believe because the, the urine test was positive. So I see him back next time. And he comes in and got like a little bump under his shirt. And so's mom. The Lyme literate physician was, had put pick lines in all four family members and was treating them with six months of home IV antibiotics for their chronic Lyme disease. Now, parents were asymptomatic, um, but since they all had chronic Lyme disease, they all had to be treated. And this guy was starting to look worse at this point, not just psychiatrically, but just medically. He didn't look right. And so I said, listen, I'm concerned. I said, from what I've been reading, this is not a, a approved form of treatment for Lyme disease, and the diagnosis is still a little suspicious. I said, I think you need to go see somebody else because you just don't look right. Uh, and, and it was a learning moment for me because I didn't see him then for about a year. I think I sort of pissed him off. Um, eventually, he came back to see me. I saw him about a year, year and a half later, came back in, and now he looked horrible. Um, because as it turned out, he did not have chronic Lyme disease. What he did have was a synovial, um, uh, synovial sarcoma of his kidney and a football-sized tumor on his kidney was not evaluated further or treated for about a year and a half or two years because it was being treated for chronic Lyme. And of course the explanation is, well, of course, when we start to treat you with these parenteral antibiotics and kill off the, the bug, that's why you're feeling worse. It's actually a sign that you're getting better. He went on to have a really complicated course, went through chemotherapy that was marginally effective. He developed a coagulopathy uh, as a result. They had, he came in and he showed me his scar it looked like they had revived somebody from an autopsy. Remember the autopsy scars, the big zipper, the double Y? That's what he had because they had to split him open stem to stern to do arthrectomies or to do a thrombectomy both in his heart and his lungs. They had to open up his heart and his lungs to cut clots out. That's how, that's how badly he was clotted. Um, had to have a vena, kill, vena cava filter put in, was on, put on anticoagulants, um, just had a really complicated course and then died about a year, year and a half after that. So that's part of the harm of these, you know, it, so it's not always, well, it's not hurting anything. We have to ask ourselves, well, is it hurting things by not treating other treatable medical conditions? Um, and then finally, just wrapping up here, a quick word about um, beware of, again, trying to bring too much science to bear. Well, wait, I thought I, there's studies looking at functional, me, meta, you know, functional magnetic resonance imaging or other types of advanced imaging that shows that some of this stuff really makes a difference. It has some sort of an effect, right? So a couple of guys did a study to look at this. And what they were interested in is we have to express to people that our imaging technology is whiz bang cool, but um, you have to be careful on how you interpret this data. So the authors pointed out that, listen, with, with the type of imaging technology we have at our, at our disposal now, uh, it comes with a really high risk of false positives in functional neuroimaging. Because if you look at it across 130,000 voxels in a typical fMRI study, the probability of finding something there is almost a certainty, right? So these, uh, these guys decided to do a study to say, well, can we demonstrate with functional MRI imaging the ability to detect like 
emotions or thoughts. So the, they had a test subject that was given an open-ended mentalizing task. What's that mean? Well, the subject was shown a series of photographs in which people were either getting along well, having a good time, or embroiled in some sort of conflict where their faces reflected anger or violence or pain. And then the subject had to try to determine, was it calm or were they in pain or, or angry? Uh, so the subject was asked what emotion the individual in the photo was experiencing. And then they were doing functional MRI readings during this task to see, could you demonstrate a difference? And they did. So they, were showed, they showed a statistically significant increase in activation in brain and spinal cord on fMRI when viewing emotionally charged themes. That's, that's pretty cool. As a psychiatrist, I love the idea of a brain scan that can tell me about the emotional state. A couple of problems with the, with the study. The subject was an Atlantic salmon, and it was dead. These guys went to a local fishmonger, bought, bought a dead salmon, stuck it in an fMRI scanner, and showed it these pictures, but were able to demonstrate differences between the positive and negative emotionally charged valences on the pictures that were shown to the dead Atlantic salmon. Uh, that could show a statistically significant difference. Now, when you reevaluate the data doing the proper sort of statistical correction, of course, those, those differences disappear. But the problem is, is around the time the study was published, they did a survey of the literature, and 25 to 30% of the fMRI data being published in these types of studies was using uncorrected data. And these are in like some of the top major neuro neuroimaging journals. And they went to a neuroscience conference where they looked at a poster presentation, and there, 80% of the data that was being presented was not corrected. So I, I think it's important to, to maintain a fair amount of neuropsychological humility in what we do, because science is hard, medicine is harder, people are complex, Medical issues are complex. So we're, we're all trying to do the best we can, but at some point we have to cling to some predictable system of being able to evaluate our treatments and evaluate outcomes. Um, so as another of my heroes, Carl Sagan said, it seems to me what's called for is an exquisite balance between two conflicting needs, the most skeptical scrutiny of all hypotheses that are served up to us, and at the same time, a great openness to new ideas. And I really think that that's what we ought to be doing as, as clinicians. So you want to keep an open mind, but you want to try to judge things the way that we judge things scientifically. Another of his quotes, in science, it often happens that a scientist says, you know, that's a really good argument. My position was mistaken. And they would actually change their minds. And you never heard that old view from them again. They really do it. It doesn't happen as often as it should because scientists are humans and change is sometimes painful, but it happens every day. I cannot recall the last time something like that happened in politics or religion. Just a random thing I found yesterday before I put it on the slide. The last slide there shows a number of my favorite resources. I give these out to patients all the time. I have these on my website. I tell patients, listen, if you're interested, if you have a question, I'm happy to talk with you about it. But if you hear something, if you see something on TV, if a friend or a family member tells you about some whiz bang new treatment, these are places you can go to try to get a, 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 a balanced, unbiased um, assessment of what we know and what we don't know uh, about each of those topics. All right, and thank you very much.